Awesome. We can move back. Cool. The next one is actually quite interesting. Uh, potential of machine learning. So we had a combination of different ideas yesterday about machine learning, deep learning, and AI, and, and applying that to data. So I think the, the first part of uh, today was a was a good introductory kind of you know overview of data and the governance and how things can actually come together. Now we are kind of moving into the analytics side and the, the, the basically the you know how machine learning can be applied. So um, we've got Thomas. Uh, so he's got many many years of uh, experience uh, as you know uh, in software solutions innovation, and you are the uh, architect. Yeah, tech in the past. In the past. So I'm really looking forward to to your uh, presentation. Let's we'll see you know how to develop that potential. So thank you very much. Applause for Thomas. Thank you very much. My name is Thomas Sikra, and I'm representing Summit Software. Um, we are doing uh, custom software development consultancy in Poland. Um, I will be talking about the potential uh, of the machine learning, but I will be also talking about the potential in terms of uh, making sure that our teams are able to, um, to provide this uh, capabilities uh, for the systems of our clients. Um, I have, I stated that I have 15 years of experience, but actually I have 18 years of commercial experience. And uh, I started as a developer, then I moved to a uh, solution architect. I was a lead of a uh, new technology design team. And for the last seven years I'm a CIO of, uh, of software, solid software. So, what we typically do, uh, we are developing systems, we are extending systems for, for our uh, customers. Recently, for a few last years, we are we tend to focus on travel industry. And I totally agree with uh, what Ido said yesterday. It's really, really challenging these days to, to provide a data warehouse with a structured model and it's mm, uh, providing a very rigid way of querying data for, for the analysis. Uh, every single quarter we are having a new project, a new product is being uh, adopted. Uh, there is the composition of existing uh, products into uh, some problems. Uh, bigger models are, getting, uh, are being decomposed to microservices and uh, uh, and, and there is a massive hype in remodeling as well, so it's, it's really difficult to uh, to provide data, uh, data warehouse in a, in, a, in a traditional sense. Um, and obviously, whatever we are talking about the machine learning, we need to have data. We need to have quite a lot of data to uh, to train our models to, to get the essence of uh, uh, of the business. Uh, so. We do actually prefer and introduce machine learning in a, as, a, as a final stage of, uh, of the adoption that starts from prototyping, from actually sketching um, the visualization, explaining the business how it should look like, how it can look like, and what they would like to the data to, um, um, to help them. Very often, we need to introduce this uh, uh, conversation. So, previous uh, very useful uh, presentation. IT is not a producer, IT is an enabler of, of change. And I think it's a very, very important uh, finding. So, the Project management stands on three pillars here. The people who need to be uh, motivated, who need to know what to do, who are in, engaging uh, closely with the business, who are able to be in a, in a position of the con having a conversation, meaningful business side conversation. That's, that's critical. That every single what's standing between those two entities is, is uh, introducing waste in a lean software development sense. 
then obviously knowledge, and this is important for on both sides of the uh, of the enterprise, uh, business and technical. And finally, access to data, knowledge about how to use the data, and, um, and the technical capabilities uh, available. So, what can we do from the management side of things to make a project happen? We need to have a team and a normal or quite well established model of uh, of presenting uh, uh, the development skills is, is a t-shirt but the t-shirt is not enough in my, in my humble opinion it's we need to have a little bit broader specialist uh, um, paradigm and, uh, uh, introduced in, and we need to have not only um, front-end or back-end or machine learning um, and this is contrary to what I heard uh, uh, on a few occasions here on this uh, conference. Um, what's really working for us is, uh, is having a team that's empowered and is able to actually crack on, not only in a single platform, but the uh, multi-platform. Uh, uh, so more and more we are trying to hire uh, developers who are um, who, uh, went through at least one uh, um, cycle of, uh, of the technology introduction uh, because uh, I hear, um, I face a lot of uh, young developers uh, who would like to solve every single production with uh, every single problem with uh, Node.js, React and, uh, and, and D3 so it's just not enough so when we continue, we will build a, 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 a developer who has more specialists and this can go and go and go on. And, and I'm sure looking at quite a lot of people here, we, we know what, what's going on. We, uh, we have gone through a few technologies, a, a few approaches and, uh, and it just uh, um, making us better. So when you, when you compose uh, uh, quite a few people uh, with this comp um, uh, driven model, then you have quite a full team and hopefully this team is not too big. So this picture represents a typical scrum driven team, software development team that's going to uh, solve a business problem, that's allocated to solve a problem. In this diagram I see one problem. There are only three people that actually produce the software. Uh, but it's not a key learning. The key learning is that there are quite a lot of integration interactions between the people in such a team. There's only three developers team. When we are in a process of designing, uh, making sure we all understand each other, doing a design thinking, etc. Then the amount of in in the interaction is just crazy, and that's why we cannot continue this for longer. We found a way to, after the design thinking phase, just split down to, to smaller teams, and it's massively reducing the amount of communication in the team. And uh, yes, there are there are risks of this. We need to be sure what. Um, uh, what has been established, what has been agreed, but when we agree on the iterative still of, uh, of release, then uh, those risks have been mitigated. Um, so, from my perspective, I need to make sure that we have a team that is able to comprehend and have a stable growing uh, curve of, uh, of knowledge being adopted into the team. Um, Typically, uh, every single project starts with establishing what the platform is going to be used to when, when we try to implement things. And, uh, and the platform is always a result of the business need, not the vice versa. Um, when, we, when we start thinking about uh, 
use technologies, and we. And it's actually, you know, quite dense diagram. And I, I was deliberately, uh, and those are not. It's just maybe 60 percent of the major uh, technologies that are currently in use. So it's it's really really demanding, in my humble opinion, for for developers and and, uh, and the teams to uh, to work on. And from the machine learning similar situation, there are the theory is quite well established since 1960s, 1780s, uh, and uh, recently uh, in the last 20 years in, in uh, neural networks and, and uh, the last 10 years in, in deep learning. But to choose a proper approach, the simplest possible to solve a problem, it's important to understand a little bit more than just the last article. In, wired. in terms of adoption, uh, we start to we tend to start with human somewhere on the, on the business side, representing the business need, uh, explaining to us what's wrong, what's not working. Uh, we then visualize this, and during the visualization, we actually prototype the data access. So without a rigid structure, you need to introduce some, some processing around it. Um, obviously, that's very important to have the governance uh, in, in the process. It's, it's, uh, we could have another 30, 60 minutes conversation about how the project should be governed. Um, when the data collection is done, we can move to to adopting some sort of machine learning. The simpler the better. Please don't try introducing deep learning in auto survey. Like, a, a, a problem that's not appropriate for this. It's just misunderstanding, it's, it's a lack of research, it's, uh, it's a waste of resources. And when we actually finish with uh, introducing simple machine learning techniques, and then we can go to uh, actually building models that are a uh, more heavy lifting um, approach. And now I would like to go through a few use cases that are uh, a result of, of our work, uh, our implementation uh, results of, uh, uh, of uh, in, in, in innovation uh, workshops that we had with the business um, and ideas. So, the first one, I will repeat, we are talking here about the travel and uh, everything that's uh, allowing the travel industry to, to, to operate on the highest level of, of quality. Well, we have a uh, relational model. Uh, we are trying to... Uh, actually, the relational model is pre-aggregated. There are data marks in, inside the database. It's, uh, I wanted to keep it clean and as less dense as possible. I know that uh, people from the back uh, may have some problems with, uh, with watching. Uh, so I did uh, commit a lot of uh, work yesterday night to, uh, to make the figures as uh, coarse grained as possible. We are training, uh, the, uh, we are collecting data in a multi-dimensional multi form. We are training the model. At the moment, it's uh, um, it's quite shallow net, uh, not multi-layer perceptron, but let's say two, three layers of uh, uh, between the uh, uh, hidden on the hidden layers, and in the result, uh, we have a two-factor uh, ranking with risk of cancellation booking and uh, expected conversion rate. So, this two uh, factor optimization problem is allowing, is enabling the business to interact with the data and get the first remedy, being very proactive in terms of uh, taking uh, uh, business decision, business action, to contact a, uh, a passenger when, when there is a risk of cancellation of quite interesting booking. And we can see it from the properties of the data. 
At the moment, we may be using on three, uh, 400 uh, dimensions, and um, and we are using the history of the changes of visual debugging. So um, we are talking about deep learning. It's a it's a normal neural network that was established. The theory was established in the 1990s, maybe perhaps 1980s, uh, using TensorFlow. This is. Um, so another step, another iteration over the, the project was to uh, actually start instrumenting the code base, instrumenting the, the application in such a way that the data stream is flowing directly and is able is uh, enabling us to retrain the model uh, far um, uh, quicker. So uh, we can get benefits uh, of this uh, retraining we have almost uh, or closer to, to let's say real time uh, model of it. Um, what we can do in the future is actually a, a naive um, um, approach is to use an agent who is actually observing the Rakim as I said and it's uh, interacting with the business. So it's quite a naive approach. What we can do in the future is to introduce reinforcement learning that's uh, uh, enforcing the travel agents to actually follow the extra guidance to, so the algorithm is going to penetrate the market and uh, not just follow the normal uh, uh, conversation that agent is, is starting. Um, another use case completely different um, in, uh, in the space of field optimization. Uh, there is a constant fight in a business between yield, preserving the uh, inventory and, and uh, boosting sales. So sales wants to always sell them. The biggest revenue, the better. But we need to prevent our inventory. We may have not enough contracts. We may have not enough hotels in front. Um, so, it's typical optimization problem that can be solved with, uh, uh, with a little bit more details uh, presented in terms of the, uh, uh, you know, on the normal tool sets of operations team and, and reservations team. Um, without going into details because uh, it's not the place uh, for that. Um, I can only say that uh, you know there there is there are a few forms in yield management that we are extending in order to provide additional uh, visibility and uh, and control over the, uh, the communication between the, uh, REST and YM, uh, so that YM can secure the inventory and through the extra variable pricing, promotion discounts, um, reservations can actually fill up the inventory if there is anything um, um, still free or, um, or there, is, um, there is a projection over the, the sales in a given time. So those three uh, parameters are formulating the goal function. And, uh, and the goal function uh, can be uh, giving instant, uh, direct uh, um, remedy and information to teams that are uh, working in teams uh, converging um, the started bookings to pay, paid bookings. Um, another uh, example, uh, we started a, an internal project called Kula something that we wanted to introduce to uh, do a little bit of R&D that's productionized and that it's actually cutting our cost, our internal cost of the monitoring systems like data, data dog, up dynamics, uh, etc. And uh, at the beginning it was just a tool that's uh, actively monitoring the websites, uh, seeking anomalies in terms of uh, uptime and uh, um, checking the content on the site. 
And we ended up with having uh, actually a, a, an API, a, a, an APM that's driven by scripts, uh, that's uh, uh, allowing us to collect quite a lot of details about the infrastructure, about the usage of, uh, of the um, systems that we are responsible for extending, introducing. So, uh, from this data, we can actually uh, have quite a lot of conclusions in how the, uh, how the systems, not only our systems, are used. And uh, uh, we see quite a lot of anomalies in terms of uh, uptime on Mondays and Sundays, apparently. Uh, another interesting finding is that um, uh, on a map of, of Europe, you can clearly see the uh, the regions that have uh, lower stability in, in, on, on the technical side. So that's, that's another, and, and there are more and more and more, this, uh, this data is, uh, we are having quite a lot of data around that. Another use case, uh, I'm conscious of time, it's just five minutes, right? Uh, it's uh, activity, activity modeling. So, we also take care of the performance. Whenever we introduce a, a system, a, a microservice, we need to monitor it. We need to make sure that it's actually up and running. There is no point of introducing something new if it's going to break in two weeks' time. And uh, through the um, modeling of the activity, we can determine which areas, uh, which times are actually not that great in terms of the, of the uh, uh, of the giving uh, business help. Um, you will see the list of uh, actions uh, that are, are used and clearly during some time uh, the activity went down significantly. There was, a, there was a clear problem and when we... Um, when we it, it happens from time to time. Uh, we introduced an uh, autoencoder on the top of the data to gather some general uh, idea about the normal situations. If we start uh, now uh, measuring the distance between the uh, outputs of the autoencoder and, uh, and the current situation, then we may have a, a nice classification uh, with, the, uh, with the action implementation for admins. And uh, I'm supporting people. Um, adaptive scheduling. So, quite a lot of systems are running budgets. Sometimes we have 10,000, 20,000 budgets jobs uh, every day in, uh, in a system. It's difficult to actually plan uh, upfront through normal admin work or application support, when the budgets are going to run and when they are in smoothest, uh, in smoothest operation, giving the biggest advantage to the business, not reusing or overusing the, uh, the finite resources. Uh, and yes, we are in cloud world, we have full uh, HA and linear scalability, but there are bottlenecks in every single system. So, this problem is typical knapsack problem um, and it can be tackled by um, PSO. We have an implementation that's recommending where a given batch should be run in order to, to give the best um, smoothest operation. Um, uh, particle swarm optimization is really, really elegant uh, way of tackling this sort of uh, uh, aspects. It's quite general and it's, it's working really, really well. Um, and it's taking not only the place of the execution, it's taking into account the uh, resources allocation, utilization of, uh, of the resources critical to the infrastructure, and is optimizing and it's taking into account the execution plan of each of the jobs. Another an example is, the, is something that we use internally in a, in a team during the uh, continuous integration. So, the earlier approach was to have uh, BDD. Who's familiar with BDD? With, uh, okay. 
Um, so we have a feature that's checking under the load what is the reaction of the system. And uh, if we collect the, the response times and compare it with the uh, assumed uh, accepted reaction times, then we may have a, a nice um, continuous integration driven system to prevent mm -hmm. uh, a code that's not, uh, misbehaving in a, in, a, in a further systems uh, on the early stage. That's fundamental building block of every single software development. And this is having limitations because uh, this is quite common ground. When we have a model and uh, it's actually responsible for collecting uh, and measuring the uh, average execution time, putting the characteristics, and um, just say, sending a signal that something is quite different to what it used to be, then you know it's it's just boosting the productivity of the team. And another um, example, the anomaly detection. Uh, here we had some raw, raw data. Now it's it's uh, it's a model of the normal usage, the red one with uh, uh, with the blue spots that are representing quite different pattern of a usage. So uh, we may, according to the GDPR regulations, uh, uh, compare the different um, approach to use the system of a person that doesn't have the role. Uh, we also introduce causal inference in, uh, in uh, one of the systems that's uh, able to be deployed on a, on a serverless uh, architecture. When we instrument uh, functions uh, which may be not executed, so there is a kind of admission control preventing overusage in a, um, in a cloud system that's going to uh, defend our charges um, uh, and uh, um, and this system uses uh, causal inference. So, who is familiar with causal inference? So, instead of just correlating the data in the past, we take additional steps to test uh, whether the correlated or the knowledge post correlation is actually correct. We we validate this. Uh, so it's a great work of, of Professor Judah Apple uh, in 1980s, 90s. Uh, I highly recommend to, to get into this because I think it's 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 more important and uh, underutilized technique. What is really hype on at the moment is reinforcement learning. In my opinion, it's far less productive than actually you know, uh, or at least this in this uh, implementation that we went through. But we were also uh, investigating the multivariate LSTM and uh, versus the Bayesian causal networks. So all these tools are, are in our hands. It's, I, my message is contrary to Christoph. Dev teams should be uh, equipped in this. It's, it's just another tool that we may use. And to reiterate, we should start with, with something simple and rate rate. Uh, introduce a visualization, negotiate with the business whether this is actually uh, solving a problem. Then, if yes, start with something simple, implement, try to actually solve a problem before the development happens because development is the most uh, difficult, most uh, expensive part of the enterprise. And that would be everything for today. Thank you very much. Any questions for Thomas? Uh, you mentioned uh, a lot of technologies uh, you use. Uh, right, uh, exactly for, uh, how do you uh, keep your team uh, up to date with the latest uh, uh, advancements in those technologies? Well, that's a very good question. Thank you. There is no simple answer. The first point is to have a team motivated and if you find people with a high intellectual potential and who are motivated by getting a chance to try new technologies, then you don't have to do a lot. And... <coughs> do they both uh, do assign a certain percentage of all their time to learn new technologies? From my, from 
my side, I just uh, want to make sure that we are very careful with commitments in terms of timelines. We need to, on, the, my, on my position, we need to give the team to have ability to learn, to adapt to new technique. Perhaps they will not experience uh, something that's, that some could say, yes, they are the most uh, the best specialists in, in the world, in, 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 but they can do the job, they can test it. I'm making sure that the approach is actually enforcing the testing, uh, not only in dev, but QA, UAT, other environments, under load. So, you know, everything what we can do to let them a little bit of brief, uh, it's helping. some questions. So you mentioned a couple of books. First of all, it was a very technical presentation and I, and I think you really tried your best to make it more business oriented. Is that is that right? I tried. Okay, cool. No, that was good actually. So you're doing a PhD in back in London, yes. right? Yeah. What, what area? Um, well, it's, uh, it's machine learning and uh, uh, you know, control. Control theory stuff? Control theory, yes. Oh. So my guess was right. So, uh, so basically, you mentioned a couple of good points about serverless technology. So just for the audience, serverless technology is not like not having a server. It's actually taking action when needed. So you can actually get rid of a lot of charges on your cloud uh, uh, services. So for instance, if you've got AWS, Amazon, you know, IBM, whatever, if you try to take serverless uh, you know, kind of model, it basically brings down your bills massively. The second point that I think was quite interesting, uh, the way you, you are basically approaching anomaly detection. That's one of the top, I mean, one of the, uh, I, I wouldn't say it's the most, you know, the, the top one is the first priority, but it's one of the top priorities for fintech and banking. They're looking at all the transactions all the time, looking for anomalies, like when you, uh, your card or your transactions are made on your account, like in a different country, well, you know, it's less than one hour from, you know, London, but then, you know, there is a transaction in Prague, then the system basically automatically generates an alert. So that's actually quite hot. So what are the use cases for you, like the top use cases for anomaly detection uh, for solid solutions? We use it for the performance degradation tracking. Mm -hmm. And uh, the response is quite a lot of problems, regardless on the domain, can be visualized actually in a very similar way. We can, we, our Cortex can generalize this quite well. Um, specialists from one domain to another can be, you know, can be moving. Uh, so uh, we use it just to be more productive in, in terms, proactive in terms of uh, um, issues on the performance side. But it's also being uh, kind of promoted to uh, to being adopted in application support teams, so they can they can see situation earlier before. Business starts, you know, calling the phones. Uh, one final question. So, you've got a lot of business people here, and but the, many of them are basically interested in kind of some sort of technical career, or if they want to get into the technical side of machine learning. How, you know, what's the best step to start getting into machine learning on a technical side, kind of you know, getting their hands dirty or kind of you know, start coding? What do you say is the best way? Start implementing things. You know. Get, you know Perhaps uh, to get a little bit motivated is something what uh, uh, what was uh, presented yesterday. There is a MAX repository of IBM with uh, uh, with pre-built uh, pre um, assets uh, with the models. So you can crack on with uh, face recognition, with uh, the detection of of, uh, of posture, on a, uh, human uh, posture on an on a image. This is something that is motivating uh, a kind of junior. Um, I didn't tell him to say that, by the way. Just. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm taking this from this conference, actually. Okay, so cool. yeah, uh, if, uh, um, and yeah, uh, you need to have uh, basic Linux knowledge. You know how to have a Docker container uh, installed, but that's it. You know, really. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you very much, Thomas. So earlier today we had a very good talk about KPN, the Dutch Telecom uh, company, so that was the largest one in Netherlands.